week we talked about allegory analysis, which means that we are talking about two different levels of literature. And what are those two different levels? We understand literature on two different levels. And what are those two different levels? Sheila, do you remember the two different levels? Excellent. Literal and figurative. Very good. So we start with the literal. We look at concretely what's happening. And then from that, we understand what the author is discussing in a figurative sense. So literally, Ralph is a 12-year-old boy. Figuratively, he is a representation of leadership. Literally, Jack is a boy. Figuratively, he's a representation of aggression. So two different levels of meaning. One is obviously more important than the other. In symbol analysis, we're doing the same thing. We are still looking at those two different levels of meaning. As Sheila has told you, we have figurative, which is concrete, and we have the, I'm sorry, we have literal. Move this over. We have literal, which is concrete, and we have figurative, which is abstract. Boy, leadership. Boy, violence. One's literal, the other is at, um, figurative. All right. So what's the difference? Symbols are not people. Symbols are objects. Concrete objects. There is a significant difference between you and a chair. Both are existent things in the universe, but you are radically different from the chair in that you have free will, you have intelligence, you have awareness of your surroundings. You can act. You can do things on your own. You can be spontaneous. The chair cannot. The chair merely exists to be acted upon. If we talk about something with will and spontaneity, we're talking about a character and we're talking about allegory. If we talk about something that is merely an object, we're talking about symbolism. So if you want to know which term to use, allegory or symbol, think about the thing that you're looking at. If it's a person or a plot event, you're talking about allegory. If it's just a thing, a concrete object, you're talking about symbol. Um, the color red, can it be a symbol? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, why? I think or no, no, no. Oh. The first criterion of symbol is that it's a concrete object. Is red concrete? Concrete means it's perceivable by the senses. It's a visual stimulation. So yes, red is a concrete object, therefore it can be a symbol. Um, for some reason, this always stuck with me from high school. This is one of the lessons I actually learned in high school English that I still remember this day. There aren't all that many of them left up there rolling around in my head. But for some reason, I remember my senior AP teacher telling me that a symbol indicates a variety of different meanings, not simply a one-to-one -one relationship. Symbol doesn't just represent one thing. It represents this variety of ideas, and that's why I've used the visual metaphor that I've got up here, this picture. <coughs> Anybody know what a one-to-one -one relationship is in figurative language? Do you have an analogy that's just a one-to-one, -one, this thing represents this thing? No, 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 that's, uh, that's allegory. We're talking about something else. I mean, a, a device, a literary device that an uh, um, author would use. That is a one-to-one -one relationship. This thing represents this thing. Uh, similar. simile or metaphor. Very good. Metaphors and similes are simple. This represents this. One-to-one. -one. Very easy. Aha. Symbols are one representing many. That makes them different from metaphors. Symbols are complex. Symbols have depth. Th symbols sometimes are difficult to understand, and authors develop them in many different ways. It's not simple. Uh, let's think about red for a moment. So red could be symbolic of, of what? Yeah. Anger. Anger. Excellent. What else could red represent? Anger. Love. Love. War. War. Warmth. Warmth or heat, but that's physical. So we're trying to get it to represent something abstract. So we wouldn't want warmth necessarily, unless you're talking about a warm personality, like kindness. Would red represent kindness of personality? No, it doesn't seem to make sense, right? Red would represent something that's a little bit more violent, a little bit more aggressive, like passion. Very good. I like that. Passion, love, war, anger, violence. 
Are all five of those ideas related to each other? Oh. No? Yeah. What do you think? I think what? They're all like passionate ideas. Excellent. They're all passionate ideas. Do any of those seem not to relate to you? I think that love, romantic love, is born of some of the same volatile, aggressive passion as war is. Now, that might be a little bit challenging, but the point that we use red to represent both danger and violence and love on Valentine's Day is a fact. We use the same color to represent those two ideas. They're related to each other. So I've got red. And here I've got it representing love. And I have it representing war. And I have it representing passion. And I have it representing danger. And I have it representing violence. That's a symbol. And they're wonderful in literature and poetry because they can move. You can use them from one piece of literature to the next. And sometimes they have a little bit of a different meaning here and a little bit of a different meaning there. And sometimes two authors use them the same way. But symbols are pretty complex. When you use that term in this class, symbol, you should be referring to this specifically. And today I want to teach you a method for understanding what it is. So how can you find a symbol in literature and understand what it represents and what the author is saying with it? Ask these four questions. These four questions will give you all the information you need to determining what a symbol means. And we're going to apply these four questions to Lord of the Flies today. So um, if you have the, uh, the symbol analysis worksheet, by the way, on the back side of it or the second page, you have those four questions in sort of a graphic organizer chart that you can use. Uh, but by the way, those of you who have it probably already know this. Um, what's our first symbol in Lord of the Flies? What will we focus on first? Yes. Thank you very much, Kelsey. The conch shell. So ask yourself these four. There will be some overlap. How do characters interact with the symbol? How does Ralph with it uh, Ralph interact with it differently from Piggy, differently from Jack, differently from Simon, differently from the little ones. All of them interact with it in very specific ways. And we must have all of that evidence. And don't forget that interaction can be passive as well as active. Who seems least connected to the conch? Who seems to interact with it in any way the least out of those four boys? Um, uh, OK, out of the four boys, though. You, you've, got, you've got a point. Simon, correct. The other three, Ralph, Jack, and Piggy, seem to have different sorts of interactions with it very actively. But Simon doesn't seem connected to it at all. That's still important evidence. So don't forget, passive as well as active. Uh, what does it do? So it is doing something to characters. Or it's doing something by characters. That means characters are using it as a tool. This third question is sometimes difficult for students because it's so incredibly obvious. When I say what are the qualities of the symbol, I mean what are the necessary qualities of the symbol? What do all conch shells have in common? That's what I'm asking. What do all conch shells have in common? This answer can come from outside the book. But you would still have to ask it. How does the author describe it? This answer is inside the book. You're looking at the imagery that he uses. Oh, and in class today, we'll have to focus specifically on the pages where Golding describes the shell to see how he describes it, to understand it. An author will describe a thing in a very specific way using language intentionally. Those are, yes? Uh, is the fire symbol? Yes. 